You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. You wanted it, you got it. A radio program that helps teach you options trading inside and out, basic to complex. This is Options Bootcamp. Whether you want to learn how to protect your portfolio, generate income, or even become a master of volatility, the Options Bootcamp drill instructors will break it all down for you. Now, let's get you into peak options trading shape. Here are your Options Bootcamp drill instructors. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again to kick off Education Wednesday, one of my favorite days here on the network. Really, they're all my favorite days. It's hard to choose a favorite, but Education Wednesday is certainly up there. It's a day where you get your double dose of education goodness. It kicks off, of course, with everyone's favorite educational program, Options Boot Camp. A little bit later today, you're going to get live to tape. A good dose of Options Playbook Radio will, of course, be available on demand shortly thereafter over there. So if you need your one-two punch of Options Educational Goodness, you know where to go. And, of course, if you want to go above and beyond, join us live throughout the week. Get access to our pro Q&As. Had an awesome one this week. Scott Nation's coming in, doing double duty. He liked it so much the first time he wanted to come back and do it again. He enjoyed your questions that much, listeners. Came in and do it again this week. Of course, you got oddities coming up. On Friday, all the live stuff they're in. You got our giveaways, everything else, all the fun stuff. You know where to go to learn more if you're ready to take that next step to embark on that adventure with us listeners. Then head on over to theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club. Don't tell anybody. It's a secret. And of course, however you listen, live after the fact, hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom. We do love to hear from you, especially on days like today. We're going to open up the mailbag. You folks on boot camp are not reticent about asking us questions. So we endeavor whenever possible to squeeze as many of you on just to keep that mailbag from exploding. So we're going to do that today. And who's going to help me do that? None other than the black-hatted one himself, Mr. Dan Passarelli from Market Taker Mentoring, what the cool kids call um to um. Mr. P, welcome back to the program. How go things in the land of um to um, sir? Things are pretty darn good over here, Mark. Pretty darn good. How are things uh, over in your neck of the are woods? Are you starting to embrace that branding, the um to um branding? Are you working on that? Maybe make some videos and materials behind the scene to really roll with that? I like it. I've got the uh, the Hanson brothers working on our theme song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's the long-awaited sequel to um bop is um to um. <laughs> wow, that was a deep pull, Hanson. <laughs> I haven't heard about that one in a while. But you know what we haven't heard about in about at least a week, Mr. Dan? And I know you were telling me right before showtime is what you were busy doing right before we started the show. You've been busy raiding. So the folks want to know, sir, what's your rating? Oh, man, I'll tell you, I've had a lot of things lighten up options raider over the past couple of days. And, um, oh, geez, what did I do? Uh, had some SDC calls. Close, put it on yesterday, close out 83% winner today. Got to like that. Got to like that. Um, and then what do I got? I got. H-I-M-X, which I put on yesterday and I closed half the position uh, thus far to lock in some profits, kind of playing with some house money right now. Um, and, and, and on Ride, R-I-D-E also. Lordstown Motors. You got to have an EV maker in there somewhere, right? <laughs> you got to. <you> <laughs> it's required by law. As we <laughs> keep on rolling, it is also time, listeners, you got to have some of your mail on the show. So let's do it. It is time for the mail call. 
mail call. Time to look at questions submitted by our listeners. Ah, so festive. Even in the depths of winter, starting to get there here in Chicago, listeners. It still recalls the heady days of 4th of July and summer. It's always 4th of July or Flag Day or Veterans Day or Memorial Day here on the show because you always have that, that fun, festive music. But of course, things are not quite as festive as they were a week ago here on the network. This time last week, listeners, we asked you a very fun question. It was quite simply, you know, we saw that big sell-off as a result of Omicron. VIX had exploded into the 30 handle coming into that week. We asked you, hey, you think this thing has legs or is this just kind of a flash in the pan? Quite simply, was VIX going to close above or below 20 by Friday? About two-thirds of you came in on the below 20 tip, which I can't blame you. I was there earlier in the week myself as well, as it just seemed like the natural play is what we've seen happen time and again throughout the year. The last week, I should say, though, it didn't quite happen. We saw multiple sell-offs that kept vol prolonged just enough so that we didn't close below 20. So we thought, you know, we'd give you a chance to take a second swing at bat there, listeners. And we do it again this week. We say, hey, let's punt. Same question this week. Vic's going to close above or below 20 by Friday. A much more contentious outing this week, Mr. Dan. So if you have a vote, have at it. And be more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for, sir? Well, I think the audience is definitely going for below 20. If they were for below 20 last week, they're definitely for below 20 this week. And, man, it's 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 tight. Um, we've got two more days. I mean, I think I'm going to go with below 22, but not with below 20 also, but not drastically. Um, it just seems to be trending that way. It just seems to be the natural order of things. Does seem to be trending in that direction as we speak. VIX holding at about a 20 and a half. So not that far from that 20 level. Does seem like they've all just decided, you know, this Omicron thing that everyone was terrified about. Oh, we can change it. Go. Yeah, yeah, not so much anymore. And uh, they're coming for all that ball. And they have done so pretty aggressively. Right now we're pretty split, Dan, with about 57%. So a slight majority there for above 20 and about 43 percent for below 20 you Mm -hmm. got got one day left to play listeners so get your get your votes in but yeah this is a tight one coming down to the wire it's going to be i guess it really kind of depends what happens the next 24 to 48 hours of course where we look from a vol perspective but right now doesn't seem like there's any reluctance to crush the bid on all the vol out there so let's see let's see if two weeks in a row if you guys, so far, you're not, you're still not fading it completely. You're still saying above 20. So perhaps you got burned once and you don't want to go down that road again. Let us know over there at options is the place to go. Speaking of places to go, you guys can go all over the place to leave your reviews and your comments on the show. Just like Andy James here did. He got a little bit of love for us here, Dan. Got a lot of love, actually. He says, hello, options boot camp. I just wanted to say that I'm new to this whole options thing. But you guys are leading me in the right direction. Well, you are not alone there, Andy. You have many compatriots who are new to the options thing. So don't, don't feel like you're, you're alone out there. He says, I've downloaded just about everything that involves options on Apple podcasts and you guys are, Oh, in all caps, far and away the best. It's not even close. Most of the rest are people like me who learned about options as retail traders and then think they are qualified to teach others. <laughs> None of them came up to the trading pits as market makers, let alone created the options podcast genre. Oh, why thank you, sir. Or wrote a popular educational book on the topic. I just wanted to take a moment to thank you guys. Can't believe you've been putting out this show for free all these years. The options market owes you a debt of gratitude. Well, thank you, Andrew. That's very kind words. Your praise is effusive, sir. So we we thank you for that. Yes, the option market does owe us a huge Dead of gratitude. No, I'm just kidding. But we do love and appreciate that kind of feedback. Out there. You guys, after all, the reason we do keep putting this show out week after week, month after month. You notice there's no sponsor tag on this show. We do it because we love you guys. So uh, we enjoy doing it. And it's feedback like this that really, uh, really does warm the old cockles of the heart. Dan, I know for you, even the determined Grinch that you are, a message like this must warm your Grinch shrunken heart, sir. 
it, it, it more warms the cockles uh, than the heart. But yeah, it definitely warms the cockles. All right, let's keep on going here. Oh, Dan, remember last week we had our options book club. <laughs> I knew oh, yeah. we, I knew we were going to have some some comments on this. And here's an interesting one. A lot of people went along this line. They went on the uh, the textbook line. This particular one comes from Jason, Jason Cruz. He says, hi, OBC. My textbook back in finance was Hull's options, futures, and other derivatives. Do you guys have any familiarity with that one or know where it could rank among the ones you all discuss? You know, that's an interesting question there, Jason, because you weren't alone in suggesting that and some others. A lot of people went the textbook route, and that wasn't my initial consideration when I was when I was putting that segment together. I was thinking about you know, more consumer-oriented books that you would probably buy and and put on your bookshelf and read as opposed to the the textbook instructional way. Now, I know the Natenberg book has kind of become a textbook out there, and it's being marketed as that. So that certainly, I suppose, would qualify in the textbook arena. But yeah, the Hull one is interesting. I, you know, your question makes me want to go back and check exactly what textbook I had, because back when I was in college, derivatives were not really a thing that was taught. And after the whole bearings fiasco, I thought, you know, I probably should learn something about these. So I, as an undergrad, I was actually a TA at the time, so that helped. They allowed me to take classes in the graduate business school. So I had to go all the way up there to take a course on derivatives. That's how far I had to go to learn about these things. And I have the textbook around here somewhere. I have to dig it up. I don't think it was Hull. I went looking online really quickly. That book's been around forever. The Hull book, there are many, many, many iterations of it. Options, futures, and other derivatives is, of course, the one you're talking about. And yeah, I don't, I'm looking at all the different covers. There are many versions. I don't think this was mine. So I need to go. I think mine was just called derivatives, plainly enough. So I need to go dig that up. It might be in the storage here and see exactly which one that was. But I I only have a passing familiarity with the Hull book. Uh, Dan, do you have any familiarity with this book? Have any of your students come to you? having read this and have any thoughts on it? And B, how weird is it that we have two prominent hulls in the options market? Of course, Blair, who, of course, uh, was a trader and made a bunch of money, sold hull to Goldman, uh, infamously ran for the Senate here and had the Senate seat locked up before his campaign kind of fell apart. And some guy named Barack Obama swept in there and took over the Senate seat. And look how it worked out for him. Yeah, so two infamous hulls. But uh, this one we're talking about here is John Hull. Do you have any familiarity with him or his book, Dan? Man, I'm trying to remember <clears throat> what book it is. I know it, it's downstairs on the bookshelf. Maybe if uh, maybe if you're going to give a long-winded uh, something after this, I'll run downstairs and run back up. Are you saying I'm long-winded, sir? How dare you? It's not like I get <laughs> no. paid to talk or anything. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to remember now, man. Uh, it kind of does sound familiar. I, I, I bet that might be the one. You know what's weird? I've never met John Hull. I've never talked to him. I don't know anyone who has. I've never seen him at a conference. Everyone else, you know, we've had Larry on. You're obviously on the network on a regular basis. Most of the prominent authors, Blair Hull has obviously been on. They've all been on. I've engaged. I've seen them somewhere at an event. I don't think I've ever interacted once with John Hull. Have you? No, I didn't know. I don't believe so. Weirdly enough, if you search for his books on Amazon, you know who's the next person to come up there, Dan? Other people that you might want to look at? Who's that? Well, it's Larry McMillan. Then it's you. (laughs) 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 Little bait and switch there. But yeah, you two are neck and neck there. So yeah, it's it's good company to be in. So yeah, he's been kind of the guy holding down a lot of the university level education for a long time. Maybe I need to reach out and get him on the network here. It's a good textbook, Jason. I I have some passing familiarity with him. That's about it. But yeah, I wouldn't run out and say, hey, you should pick up a textbook. Outside, I, I know I said the Natenberg. Uh, but the reason I said the Natenberg, and I don't really think of it as a textbook, but it kind of can be viewed in that light, is because I always view the Natenberg as more of the the practical version as opposed to kind of the whole. He's an he's an academic. So, I mean, Natenberg is too, but he also spent some time working with the trading groups and stuff. But he geared Natenberg geared his towards more of the professional trader, whereas the whole book is kind of more of like you said, kind of an introductory academic treatise on the topic. But yeah, maybe I need to uh, reach out to them and see if we can get him on the net just because he's been writing this book for <laughs> for 30 odd years. <laughs> It'd be worthwhile bringing him up. So a good recommendation. We didn't really have a lot of textbooks in mind for this, but we'll review that and see maybe maybe we need to think about some top textbooks you should have out there. But I mean, 
Hull kind of dominates the space out there, unless you view Natenberg, or some people may even could view McMillan. I don't think of it as a textbook. Some people could view it in that light. But a good question, nonetheless. A lot of you others wrote in with honorable mentions for Hull out there. So if you want a textbook, you could do worse than that one. All right, let's keep on rolling out there. Let's go to our next one. Patrick says, I have a question for the podcast. Well, you sent it to the right place, Patrick. He says, my question is about protective puts for long-term buy and hold in something like SPY. Is it preferred to pick a strike at monthly options expiration and then roll up or down? At what point does one choose to roll up or down? Let's say 50% loss or gain. And then also, would it make sense to do a complex collar with a shorter dated out-of-the-money call, either weekly or bi-weekly, and a month or two out on the long put? Thanks. Well, Dan, he has a lot of moving parts he wants to put together here with his hedge. So first off, he wants to know, should he choose his strike at expiration once a month and then decide to kind of roll from there? Uh, if he does that, what metrics should he use to decide when to roll, he suggests a 50% hit, but there are ways we could play with that. And he also wants to know if it would behoove him to add some more layers to this, what he calls a complex collar by selling some nearer dated premium against it, a call in the weeklies, and then maybe doing another put against it as well. So more of a collar with a put spread kind of kicker against it. What are your thoughts on all that, Dan? Well, I mean, as far as just outright buying a put every month, you know, that's an expensive hobby. Um, you know, like I'm looking at, uh, let's see here. Let me just pull up Spy. I mean, if I look at the spiders, how how much was he? Uh, I guess he didn't really state what strike he was going to be doing. But no, he didn't I, say specifics. Yeah. I mean, if I go out like, thir- well, there's an exactly 30 day option and I just go a couple bucks out of the money, that's seven dollars which is, what is that, like close to 1.5%, right? 7.67 divided by uh, 468.5. Yeah, it's like 1.6% a month. It's 18% a year. Um, So, I mean, I don't know, unless he's talking about doing longer-term ones, but then if the market really takes off you'd not only lose on theta you yeah so either way like long story short i could talk about this for a good 15 minutes but that's an expensive hobby the only thing that you can do well i mean you can do a lot of things but um your your alternative stated here to do a collar or maybe a more complex collar where you're buying a put spread and selling a call against it um that that's better. But, you know, like you also have to think of what you're trying to hedge, too, because if you do a put spread like that's pretty limited insurance, you know, it, first of all, it doesn't really kick in until it hits the strike, presuming you're holding it for the long haul. But then if it's one of these situations where the market tanks 20 percent, um, it's going to only do you a little bit of good. So, uh it, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to look at, and it all kind of comes with expectations and exactly the very specific thing that you want to hedge against. I know that's a roundabout answer there, but the best one I can I can give you right now. Yeah, I think if you're going to pursue this, uh, I agree with Dan. I definitely prefer the complex collar route on this. If you want some data on this, and I have talked about this with with Matt and his various back testing on the advisors option, so check out some episodes of that. As well, Patrick, even if you're not an asset manager or an advisor, even not looking for one of those, it's worthwhile checking out that show because we talk about some interesting analysis. In fact, just our last show, we'd had a whole episode about how to pay for puts, <laughs> including some ways you may not have thought about. We call them some devious ways to pay for puts. So check out that. But in addition to that, the most comprehensive study I've seen on collars and their performance over time across a variety of assets was done by the OIC. I think the most recent one was about five years ago or so now. So it needs to be updated a little bit. It was called collaring the cues initially. And then they expanded it to every asset class. You name it, gold, whatever. And they found a bunch of different ways, including what you talk about here, this modified collar. You're on the right track. Pushing that put out is the way to go. They did it 
up to six months. You may not be willing to to do that far out. So maybe you want to talk somewhere around three months instead, but you're on the right track. Push the put out a bit. Now that's going to get more expensive. So you have to do things to offset that. And that's where that collar, that complex collar comes in. You have to sell some near dated premium on the call side. And of course, some more near dated premium on the put side. Now the downside to this are a couple. The put skew is ridiculous right now. So you're not going to get a lot of juice to offset that by selling the call. That's why the put helps there as well. But also, you have some pretty strong risk management because now you're short a lot of near-term gamma and you have longer-term vega against it. And if you know much about the Greeks, you know that gamma could explode in your face really quickly if, if let's say, another repeat of the Friday sell-off from a couple of weeks ago happens again. That negative gamma is going to bite you a lot more than that longer-term vega is going to help you. So you need to be pretty familiar with how those Greeks interplay if you want to take this strategy over the longer term. So that's one way to do it. If you sounds like if you're a little bit spooked, maybe by what's going on out there, another way to go is start scaling back your holdings, or you can go the way Brian likes to do on his OPR show, which is the old fig leaf, which is swap out your underlying completely now with some spy calls usually meteor in the money, a little bit longer term calls. So now you've taken some capital off the table. That's safe. And the rest is just at work on the calls. Of course, if the spy does drop, you have all those Greeks working for you. Your delta will decrease. Your rate of loss will decrease. Your vol will increase. That'll slow how much money you're losing, et cetera. And then you could turn that also into a bit of a modified covered call, what he calls the fig leaf, which is you could sell a narrow dated call against. Now, you're not quite covered. You have to pay attention to that one either. But that way... Over time, that'll offset some of your outlay. And meanwhile, the, the capital that you saved by taking the stock off the table, that could be sitting in cash or whatever else it is if you're concerned about these levels right now. So there's a, a few ways you could proceed here, Patrick. But I think you're on the right track. You kind of intuitively came to the answer that both Dan and I were leaning at. You have to play with it a bit if you want to really do the collar effectively right now. But you have to be on top of it as well. You got to be pretty savvy. And that's that's a lot that I can understand maybe why you want to maybe dial it back and maybe... Maybe the substitution route is a better way for you to go. All right, let's go to, let's go to big, I like this handle, Big Ted. <laughs> big Ted wants to know, why do they say it's never really worth it to exercise your options early? Isn't that the whole point of buying an option? It gives you the right, but not the obligation to exercise your, stri- your stock, excuse me, at that strike price at any time. So why wouldn't I take advantage of that? Dan. Why wouldn't Big Ted take advantage of that? Why are we telling him to not do that? Why are we limiting his options, Dan? How dare you, Dan? Well, Big Ted, uh, sometimes you will exercise them early. Um, I mean, if you're like a trader as opposed to an investor, you're never going to exercise them. Um, But if you're an investor, you might exercise them early. But here's the thing. You would never exercise it if, if there's time value. Now, we can kind of split hairs on some of this when it comes to calculating the interest rate or the the interest component if you're exercising puts, calculating, you know, the time premium versus dividend if you talk about the uh, X date for exercising calls. But just generally speaking, those two things aside, if there's time premium in the option, as soon as you exercise it, that just gets flushed down the toilet. So you would never exercise an option except for the two cases I just mentioned if there is any time value left. But if there's no time value left, if it's trading for parity, then, and you want to own the stock or be short the stock, then yeah, absolutely. Why would you not exercise early? Big Ted, think of it this way. You have an option that's maybe, maybe it's worth 50 cents, but it's only got 25 cents of intrinsic value and it's got 25 cents of a time premium attached to it. Now you exercise that, bam, that 25 cents is gone. You just gave that away. But if you sold it in the marketplace, you get all 50 cents. So you could see why economically you're at a disadvantage 99.9% of the time when you're exercising those options outside of those scenarios that Dan said you want to capture a dividend or a few other times like that. So yeah, it's almost always going to behoove you if you have a long option and it has some time value left to sell it in the marketplace rather than exercise. Another time you might want to think about exercising is when things get crazy wide, you'd be deep in the money at that point. And the spread is so ridiculous <laughs> that to sell it, it's going to make you, they're going to make you sell it below parity, which sometimes can happen. 
Maybe in those rare scenarios. People have asked us, is that an okay time to exercise? Well, okay, maybe in that rare scenario as well. But that's very rare as well. So you can see Big Ted, you're always better off most times. Just selling the option if you are so inclined. Uh, looks like we got people in the chat chiming in here. Age in the chat says, a hull is great, but it requires advanced mathematics. Yeah, I yeah, know that's true. And Natenberg can make you do some math as well. Like I said, I still view Natenberg as having a little bit more of a practical bent. Hey, if you look at it, there's a reason why at the end of the day, when everybody walked onto the floor of the SIBO, they handed you a Natenberg. Or in Dan's case, they made you buy a Natenberg. They didn't say go to Ed Hall. They didn't say, I don't think McMillan was around then, but if it was, they didn't say go get McMillan or any of these other ones. They said, hey, here's your Natenberg. Go learn this, kid, because we want you to have a practical understanding of how these things trade. That, to me, is the litmus test. At the end of the day, they didn't care. They wanted you to have the best practical understanding, not the academic understanding. And so that's why they handed you a Natenberg. So for me, that kind of says it all. That's where the money was on the line, and that's the one they went with. And not just because he was a Chicago guy or anything like that. It's because it was the one that best prepared you to walk into the trading pits. Now, obviously, the book alone couldn't. You had to do a lot of other things. But still, it, it was a, the best starting point at the time. Nichols chiming in. So I definitely prefer Natenberg over Hull, but Hull isn't bad either. <laughs> All right, so you got a couple of wishy-washy votes for Hull, I guess you could say, and a couple of votes uh, for Natenberg. Dan, what do you think? You think we should do a a textbook roundup maybe one of these days on the show? Well, that would be interesting. Um, <clears throat> I can tell you that I've only read one options textbook, and I read it all the week before finals in college. <laughs> like, I don't think I opened until the week before finals in college. So um, I might not have a, a whole bunch to say, but... You know what you need to do? You need to revamp trading options Greeks for the academic market, sir. Add a few more graphs, maybe just waste some pages so it's double the page count, and then you can sell it for like 500 bucks on the academic market. What do you think, sir? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to take out all the entertaining stories and try and make it as boring as yeah, possible. Yeah, can't be fun. <laughs> no. Someone's got to challenge that whole guy. He's dominating all the textbook sales for 30 years, sir. You got you to take some of that back. All right, let's go on out here to Haster. Pastor wants to know, he says, I know Mark said he has traded Bitto options recently and that he owns crypto on the crypto rundown program. But what about Dan? Is he currently trading any crypto products? So I know, Dan, you guys put out a, a crypto technicals video, I think, recently over there at um to um. So you're clearly watching them. What do you have to say here for Haster? Are you currently trading any crypto products? Yeah, I mean, I, I have not traded Bido just yet because I'm not sure what to do with it just yet with its nuances. But I mean, I do I, I do have a small account that I trade crypto with. I mean, I own some Solana, some Loop Ring, some Mana. Some Ooh, Solana. Stealth. Did you get in ahead of the massive explosion over the last couple of months? <laughs> No, not in early enough, man. <laughs> that thing was ridiculous just in the last few months. Yeah, I think it's like up some like 10,000 percent this yeah, year. Yeah, something something, like something insane. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, like I think Solana is a very interesting one, um, as is the central land. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm watching. I'm, 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 I'm dabbling. But yeah. Um, it's very, very interesting. I was I was pretty heavy into it, like maybe two, three years ago and then sort of got out and now I got back in. And man, I wish I stayed in the whole time. Uh, that whole thing has undergone some really interesting changes over the last couple of years. We had a guy in our crypto rundown program this week who was really early on Bitcoin. He was talking about how he used to have to um, go to Western Union and then MoneyGram the money to like Mount Gox, and it was it was super shady. <laughs> oh, but uh, and he says he looks now at some of the prices he was buying Bitcoin for back then, and he said it just makes him want to cry. But he he didn't hold on to it obviously because he'd have his own private island by now. Of course, Mount Gox had some issues, and the whole thing kind of blew up. So that could have been you know you could have had all that money go away, obviously too. So there were some shady issues around that at that time, but. Yeah, just uh, just crazy town there. You're right. Solana back below 200 again these days. I'm waiting for it to retrace a little more so I can get some Solana for myself. But it got up to, what did it get up to? Almost 260. Yeah, 260.06 about a month ago. So Solana, yeah, quite, on quite the rampage from, what was it? It was about $15. Actually, low. It was about three and a half bucks back in 
in February. So yeah, quite the run on Solana over the past uh, past few months out here. Now let's go to they got good handles this week. Utrial with two A's. If I'm butchering that, I apologize. Utrial wants to know why do you say someone is long or short quote premium when someone is buying or selling options? Where does that come from? Why not just long or short options? Now, that's an old holdover from the trading floor. That's what we used to say on the trading floor. You know, remember, we're just talking about extrinsic and intrinsic value, right? I forgot who asked that one. I think, oh, it's Big Ted. And uh, so that extrinsic portion, that's the extra part, right? You have the intrinsic value, which is the meat of the option. Let's say you're, you know, you have a XYZ is trading 10 bucks. And you along a nine and a half call, it's got 50 cents worth of intrinsic value. That's meat. That can't decay away. That's going to stay there as long as it hangs out at that price level. That's going to stay. And then let's say your option, though, is trading for a buck. That means you have 50 cents of extra, of extrinsic value, a.k.a. premium. And since, as we just said with Big Ted, 99.9% of the time, your option is going to have at least a little bit of time premium. That's kind of where... That all got started. Dan, is that your takeaway as well? You first encountered this on the floor of the SIBO, or you think there's some other explanation lost to the sands of time, sir? No, I mean, that's basically it. I was actually just talking about this in a class uh, the other day, and there was a reporter asking about it today. Um, like, if you think about it, like, if you think about premium com- or, uh, options compared to futures, for example, like, futures are totally linear. Like, there's a small or, you know, there's there's a all, not really negligible, but a small comparatively base um, difference between the actual spot asset that's being traded in this case stocks versus the the price of the future, and that's that's called the basis. But with and and so arguably you kind of trade a little bit the basis, but it's mainly just a long or short. But when it comes to options, like like never lose sight that that's literally what you're trading is the premium. Like like options are not like futures where they're basically just uh, a, a proxy for a directional proxy for trading the underlying. Like what the real value, what the real skill is, and what what good traders do who trade options is they focus on valuing that premium you know, the premium over parity, like that's the asset that you're, that you're actually trading and that, you know, and that's what the Greeks measure. And that turns into the conversation of everything we've ever talked about on the show. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I think, I, I think that that's a pretty good description, uh, long or short premium for sure. All right. Since you're talking futures and extrinsic value, that segues nicely into this one. I'll be nice. Usually I limit people to one question per show, but Jason's been delusion us he's all fired up about boot camp these days i'll be nice i'll do one more because it segues so nicely with what you're just talking about dan jason says hey guys question for boot camp uh or whichever show you think is more suited i think it's good for boot camp because we're talking about it right now jason he says when i purchase a long call option there is the extrinsic value to the option that i would need to make back before the contract is profitable i'm curious if a futures contract has the same kind of premium built in Or if that cost basis of a future is essentially the break-even point. Hopefully that makes sense. Thanks for any info you could share. Well, Dan, you were just talking about futures basis and extrinsic value. What do you have to say here for our buddy Jason? Getting a rare twofer today. Right. The, the, The basis is really the only difference. And, you know, yeah, I mean, like I said before, like it's a comparatively small thing. Like, like consider that futures are a hundred percent delta, uh, and no theta and no vega. Like the only difference is that basis, and and there are some people who trade, you know, who trade um, like the the yield curve on there, you know, the um, like the different expirations and trade future spreads. But you know, like you're not doing that if you're trading one lot because you're making very, very small amounts. It's more like a professional's game. Whereas with options, you know, I mean, heck, man, you can put on like a, a one lot debit call spread in, you know, something like like uh, Tesla, and you know, you can make or lose ten grand. You know, so yeah, I mean, it's a it, it it's a real different game. It's a real different game. All right, 
that music's going to do it. Are you guys doing a lot more futures options over there at um to um these days, Dan? Um, not really. Like, I mean, I've got a consulting project that I'm doing now that's pretty interesting uh, on futures options. But um, most most of our students are involved in equity options, you know, good old good old fashioned stock options and such. Good old fashioned stock options and such. Well, that music means we're kind of come up against it for this week. If you want more learning on just wait a little bit. Brian will be back in a couple of hours here to go live to tape for OPR. That'll be hitting the on-demand network a little bit later today, probably after this one hits it. So, of course, if you want to participate on those shows, you can send questions over there to Brian as well. Probably going to get him back on. I think I think we're talking next week for a live huddle there as well. So if you'd like to get at Brian live, you have a chance to do that. Probably a nice double duty next week, a double boot camp, or I should say a live boot camp, and then a live OPR. So if you like your question paloozas next week's on top of your regular pro Q&A session. A lot of Q&A is going on next week. So hopefully you get all those questions in, whatever you got, crypto, you got uh, futures options, you got textbooks, whatever you got to talk about. <laughs> hit us up. Let us know. And before we go, Dan, if folks want to hit you up to talk about rating or perhaps just life in general, where should they go? What should they do? We'll make your way on over to MarketTicker.com, my friends, and just, um, you know, hit the contact us button, and I'm glad to chat. Hit the join now button and access. We've got a whole bunch of uh, free content on our on our website. Uh, it, really great for new folks. I mean, if you're really new to this, uh, holy moly. I mean, there's lots of really wonderful stuff there. Uh, and if you're experienced, hey, we welcome you there, too. Join our chat room. There's lots of great stuff that you can do. Check it out, markettaker.com. Don't forget the second T. And, of course, next time we gather here together, Dan will be long, even more Solana. And we can talk about it here <laughs> on the show. That's going to do it here for Options Boot Camp. Like I said, OPR coming up later today. Tomorrow, you get your double dose of Episode 2 of the Option Block, as well as TWIFO. We kind of did a bit of a double TWIFO this week as well. Those of you in the Secret Club got to listen live to my chat with Tim McCourt about the micro ether futures that just got listed this week. Uh, if you're listening tomorrow to Twifo, you hear all the usual movers and shakers and everything, then you'll hear the second part of that show will be my chat with Tim from earlier this week. So if you missed it earlier this week, you get to hear it then. Of course, all of you after the fact, that'll be the first time you get to hear it on tomorrow's Twifo. Then back again on Friday, volatility views, and then of course, options oddities for all of you Secret Club fans, all the way through to next week and another episode of Options Bootcamp. We'll see you then. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>